it's a profound thing to offer an apology. An apology is not dependent on forgiveness. An apology has no excuses. An apology is me humbly coming to you and saying, oh, I see that I've hurt you, that I was inappropriate in some way. And by the way, I may not have intended to hurt you. I may not even agree that it was something for which you should feel hurt. But that's not the concern of the apology. The apology is merely recognizing that you feel hurt based on something I did or said. And so I want to own, own your pain and apologize for it. Welcome to ABC DEI, a podcast that explores topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion through stories of distinct and powerful lived experiences. If you are tired of the preaching, shaming, and theory about why inclusion matters and just want to create change already, then you're in the right place. Join us as we unlearn bias one alphabet at a time. My name is Susan Diaz. And I'm Rohini Mukherjee. Hello and welcome back to ABC DEI, a new season, the start of a new year. And we have an exciting roster of guests planned for you um, this season. Um, so to kick things off this week, we have with us um, Shari Foos, marriage and family therapist and founder of The Narrative Method. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. Right. So to kick things off, Shari, let's talk a little bit about uh, your um, sort of body of work and your your um, point of view in the diversity and inclusion space. So introduce yourself a little bit to our audiences. Thank you. So I'm Shari Foos. I founded the Narrative Method um, in 2013 after studying narrative medicine at Columbia University. I'd already been a therapist for many years, but on a whim, my husband, then 15-year-old, and I moved to New York for my kids' last three years of high school. And that's where I discovered this program. And as much as I loved and continue to love being a marriage and family therapist, what happened was magical in the program of narrative medicine, which was conceived as a way to teach empathy to doctors. There was a huge perspective about social justice and what does it mean for someone to speak for a patient? And you can extrapolate that to what does it mean for anyone to tell someone else's story? And so I have always been a big fan of the group process since I was a teenager when I was depressed and found myself in group therapy. And what was so powerful then, and I see to this day, is that as important as one-on-one -on -one relationships are, they cannot simulate a good family the way a group can. And when everyone is nodding because they understand what you're saying, you feel normal, you feel good, you feel you belong. So that's why I decided to take all of the work I had done and create a group process where people could have meaningful conversations without small talk um, based on inspirational art or videos or music or something that evokes a prompt. And then they'll go into smaller groups and discuss those prompts or in the case of writing groups, they write about them. I think it's that's incredible. Um, I think it's interesting how people find their way to diversity, equity and inclusion work and, from such different perspectives. And um, in the last episode, Susan and I were quite vulnerable about sharing our why. Um, you know, I think uh, some of the themes we talked about, you know, were were natural storytellers based on our professional um, you know, lines that we have chosen, but our why came from a personal and painful experience um, and the urge to make sure that doesn't happen to somebody else or the urge perhaps for somebody else to learn from the hard soul searching work that we had done. In Susan's case, it was, you know, a lot of bias that um, she faces as a female immigrant, uh, woman of color entrepreneur. Uh, and for me, it was in, you know, in a work situation where I was discriminated against based on how I looked. So um, 
maybe talk to us a little bit about your why and how, you know, your therapy and the narrative method and your diversity, equity, inclusion work all sort of came into focus. Thank you. Um, and thank you for sharing that stuff. I couldn't agree more. I mean, if, if all that comes of the suffering we've had is that, you know, we have a memory of it, that's really not good enough. But if we can turn it into lemonade, I have to say there are days I'm grateful for what I went through. Um, and so I was uh, an abused child. And um, in addition to that, there were never ideas spoken at my home. My parents were uneducated and incurious. And so I remember from a young age, in addition to knowing that I was getting in trouble all the time and I couldn't possibly be that bad, I knew that. Um, but I was also so starving for connecting to people with all these ideas I had, but I was told I was a question box and I was a pain in the ass and all those kinds of things. And later, as I started to grow and see in working with other abused children, that the squeaky wheel is often the creative kid. Mm -hmm. People don't really know how to work with. And so the older and older I get, God, the more I saw in some ways I could be socially accepted. And in other ways, I felt I was different. I was thinking about things more introspectively and my friends came from better circumstances. So my life has really been about trying to manifest my, my creativity, what lessons and wisdom I've learned um, having developed these 12 core concepts in the narrative medicine and the narrative method and seeing its impact on people. It's not complicated. It's just that when we share who we are in a real way and we listen to others by getting ourselves out of the way and making room to hear someone's story from their perspective, everybody wins. We, it's not that big of a tweak. Society could shift in, in one millimeter of a direction in this way, and things would grow from there. We have become afraid of each other. We have become afraid of the truth. And rather than having to be afraid of asking you where you're from or asking you about your pronouns or whatever those kinds of things might be, we need to sort of have a common rule that, look, we're all going to make mistakes. We can't be experts in other people's uh, details, but let's appreciate if other people are curious and illuminate their, their curiosity. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Thank you for sharing your story there. Um, I, I definitely want to dig a little bit deeper. What you said about that squeaky wheel is usually creativity. That stood out for me a lot. Um, I have a 10-year-old daughter and she's... Um, She's definitely a squeaky wheel. She's and her. Thankfully, I say often um, when you're lucky, you're in the right place to be that squeaky wheel. And I'm like, I'm listening closely most times to be like, how can I encourage that creativity in the way that wasn't encouraged for me? Like, don't ask too many questions. I recognize right. that, you know, don't um, like seen and not heard. Like where I'm, I'm of an age where that sort of thing was said to me quite often. Children should be seen and not heard and women should be seen and not heard and that kind of thing. So let's maybe dig into that, that, that act of telling the story. And in the green room, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, the person who's telling the story is being brave as well, right? How do we make this process more comfortable and how do we sort of make it inviting for people to stand up and say what they believe and then be open to listening? Well, thank you for that. I mean, there's so much here to unpack. One thing is when everyone's sharing their stories, then it's not the onus on one person. And the other thing I always emphasize is nobody should ever share any personal thing that feels too vulnerable to share. Why? Mm -hmm. Do it some other time or do it never. If somebody's coercing you to open up, it's, it's really not that different if, if somebody's trying to rape you. It's my story. I will tell it if and when I want to. So that's the mm -hmm. first thing to empower. And the second thing is, it's really sad that girls have been treated this way. Um, and I don't think it's going to be over any time immediately. So what we have to do is empower our girls by telling them the truth. 
This is what's happened in the past. Um, it's up to us to take our agency and our voice and our power and speak our truth and not let people shush us. And typically girls are more chatterboxes than boys. And it's really a sign of curiosity and intelligence. So anybody who's annoyed by it um, should really be, I mean, if it's an adult, I would protect my child from that adult. I would try and talk to them. And if they can't do better, uh, just make sure that they're not in a place where they are creating a, a negativity for your for your girl. I think that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I, I, I'm definitely... Um, you know, let's just go over here where the people understand us and, you know, work with them. <laughs> I'm not going to sit and preach to someone who totally doesn't get the, the way. On, on the other hand, we don't, it won't empower them to not understand this. And I think we can understand, we do. We, we, among ourselves, women have talked very deeply about all of these kinds of issues. It doesn't mean that we're angry uh 24 7 but we have to have some rage about it because we've been you know discriminated against but it doesn't have to drive our whole lives just the way other people's oppression doesn't necessarily have to drive their lives but it's up to them i i like the idea that you were talking about in terms of you know coming to this common understanding that we're all going to make mistakes, right? Just as much as when you're learning math, you make mistakes. If you're learning to be, you know, a teller, you're going to make mistakes. If you're studying artificial intelligence and complex systems, you're going to make mistakes. So just like that, when you're learning to be an ally, you're going to make mistakes. So when you're learning to share your story or, or sort of having the bias around um, you know, what people with privilege might say, you're going to make mistakes too. So um, it almost is, you know, on one hand, I think coming to an understanding that everybody's going to make mistakes, big, small along the way. I think the other part of it that I, I really liked about what you talk about is, you know, when you talked about your childhood experiences, that, that understanding that you're never too young for empathy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there is that feeling. So whether you are one or whether you are 70, empathy is something that we all do have. And so connecting back to it in some ways, it's it's less about learning um, and it's more about just taking the words and the pronouns and the constructs out of the equation and just saying that person is in pain. So how, how, how can we sort of rally around that as something that's a lot more tangible and sort of breaks down that cost of participation or the fear of putting my foot in my mouth or misgendering someone or making an assumption about somebody's religion? How do we instead just focus on empathy and then use that to build education? That's a great question. I think you have to start off by making a grand rule. You know, if you have a company or you're having a first meeting or something, Maybe not as necessary in, uh, in a smaller group, but just to say, um, because of these times, people are often overly sensitive because they've been oppressed or may seem to others to be overly sensitive, I should say. But to be truly sensitive to everyone, let's agree that unless there is malice, that if someone makes a mistake with something like a pronoun or the way that they're characterizing us, let's speak up with mutual respect and enlighten them. That's all. And then the person who's offended has an opportunity if they would like to take it, which I would suggest, to apologize. I'm, I'm so sorry. It was, it was my ignorance and I really appreciate your letting me know. I hope that didn't hurt your feelings or, or you know, just... In the narrative method, when we apologize, we call that 12, it's one of our 12 core concepts we call flowers and tears, because it's a profound thing to offer an apology. An apology is not dependent on forgiveness. An apology has no excuses. An apology is me humbly coming to you and saying, oh, I see that I've hurt you, that I was inappropriate in some way. And by the way, I may not have intended to hurt you. I may not even agree that it was something for which you should feel hurt, but that's not the concern of the apology. The apology is merely recognizing that you feel hurt, 
based on something I did or said. And so I want to own own your pain and apologize for it later on, maybe if if the one who was hurt desires, maybe I will tell you um, my point of view, but that's not part of an apology. And I think if you can get beyond the need to be right and instead seek the, the, the need to be mutually understood and the need to, to move forward because being right is, is transient. You know, it's like if you're a kid and I remember I was a kid and I, I found a dollar on a table at a restaurant. Well, that actually was somebody's tip. <laughs> you know, we, we need to be corrected so that we don't hurt other people. Mm-hmm. I want to own your pain. That's really well said. I'm going to be using that. <laughs> um, I think, you know, in our line of work, uh, over the last couple of years, for sure, we've certainly seen a lot of crisis communication in play where something goes wrong. People come out and apologize and, you know, talk about how they're going to fix it. And almost always I have a problem with the way that people apologize because there's a but that's implied in there. I'm sorry, but I didn't know that. Or I'm sorry, but I thought this, you know, and you know, as, to be su- super harsh, nothing counts before the word, but you may as well not have said the I'm sorry. How about this? I'm sorry, but I just changed my name and now I don't have to apologize for anything in the past. <laughs> I'm going to try that. <laughs> so how do we get away from that defensive stance when the, it's it's embarrassment coupled with anxiety c- coupled with you know wanting to fix it hopefully so how do you get past focusing on yourself into you know just the transformative power of apology as you say i think it ha- it's first of all it's not necessarily immediate particularly if um humility is difficult for for the person in question. I think what we have to do is pull back the way we all did in the pandemic. I mean, obviously it's still happening, but it has forced us to say, is this good enough? That's what caused the great resignation. That's what caused so many social movements to gain force. Mm. People realizing in the emptiness that the lives they were struggling to maintain weren't good enough. We need to lead with our humanity, especially given the state of uh, the climate and the future of, you know, the unknowns and the complexity that we surely have ahead of us. We have to prioritize the only thing that matters, and that is life in, on this planet, um, the planet getting healed, people getting healed, and every individual having their inalienable rights to freedom of choice and freedom of religion and all of the kinds of inherent respect that are obvious that people sometimes uh, still struggle with understanding. I don't know how we educate that mentality, but I do believe it's not going to change without education. So in answer to your question, here's how, little by little, in groups, by creating groups of people, groups of different people who agree to come together for the purpose of knowing each other, because that is its own treasure. That opens doors, opens your whole vista to realize, oh, wow, here's this person I've never seen before, who I never would have stumbled upon, telling my story or illuminating something I didn't quite understand, or teaching me something I didn't know. If I only surround myself with people I already am similar to, it might be fun, but it's not expanding my my capacity as a human being to be in the big world. And I think that's what we all deserve. Yeah, we we talk a lot about um, kind of both sides of it. We talk about the need to get outside your echo chamber, you know, because it really just reinforces views that you have, good or bad or biased or not. Um, but it's important to understand, even if it is, you know, if if 
if you're pro vaccine, it's it's important to understand and have some perspective on where some of the anti vax sentiment is coming from, in order to j- just know. And you know, is it ignorance? Is it um, a general disbelief in science? Is it you know, a phobia of needles? Is it the unavailability of appointments? You know, and I think those are all very valid reasons that have led to some of that sentiment. Um, And so I think it is important to get out of the echo chamber. I think on the receiving end, you know, what you're talking about in terms of hearing everybody tell stories is it also breaks down that monolith, um, right? Susan and I have a lot of similarities in our backgrounds, but we are very different in, in many different ways. So are there times when she's telling a story and I'm completely nodding and I see myself in that story? Yes. But are there times and experiences that she has that I have no um, connection to other than my friend went through that? Also, yes. Sure. Um, you know, and I think it's important that it becomes about the story, not just the person where you say, oh, yeah, this, you know, immigrant woman of color working in marketing yeah. were basically the same. Right. Well, I think you're also talking about hierarchy. So we do this really cool thing when we work with companies. It's called the 12 minute connection. And over a period of time, based on you know what the what the people want to do, every single person has a one on one with every other person. So if you work at an institution or a school or a big company, you may see lots of people, but you don't know their name. And so you'll avert your eyes. That's crazy. Now, you may see them off campus and then feel comfortable going up to them. But I want to break down these unnecessary barriers because they really just come from the fear of rejection. So when it's time for the lowest, you know, the newest hire, lowest person on the totem pole to have a one on one with the CEO, And the CEO has a chance to see this person's mind and heart. That can be a real revelation. And it really it really starts to show us that through the course of our lives, we do lots of different jobs for different reasons. Don't count out someone because their clothes are not expensive or because they're unhoused or because they are the CEO. We are all human beings at heart. And if we are willing to be reached and reach out toward others, we can't be stopped. We can solve these horrible problems in climate and so forth. There's 8 billion people to do this job. Why are we only getting, you know, I don't know, a few million? Mm. Yeah. And I'd imagine that some of that connection has become a little bit harder to achieve. I mean, I I totally love the two-dimensional world. I often joke that I would upload myself to a cloud if I could, Uh, but I am aware that that is not typical and it's hard to form those connections. Are you seeing a big difference in that uh, since the pandemic? It's so amazing because my work is so tied into eye contact and body language and reading people's expressions. So when I had to start going online, I was really worried, but I'll, my mind has been blown and I want to be on the cloud with you. <laughs> what I've discovered is what you make up in the fact that you can really see people much more intensively, much more close up. And from all over the place at the same time, the power of that is, you know, there's nothing like live, but we can't always accommodate that. And that's one of the reasons we are now specializing in remote connections among employees who are in different places, because there is a very special possibility that can occur if you use this medium correctly. And I think it's, you know, in part using breakout rooms, um, uh, involving every single person. It's not lectures. It's not people, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like real talk from heart to heart, from head to head. And so I think that what we have been able to accomplish in this medium, some of it will, will stay forever because of logistics, but also because it does provide something that we can't do live. Um, I have a final question for you. Well, final from me um, that, you know, just as I'm 
thinking about the simulation of this in real life. So, um, and maybe you can pull pull this from, from your own uh, practice, whether with groups or with individuals or couples. If you're starting a conversation, you know, with um, perhaps either saying or admitting something that um, that hurt you or traumatized you, or on the other hand, listening to it and understanding that you are part of the problem. How might that conversation go? And, you know, is there a good way to start that conversation on either the giving or the receiving end? Great question. What is imperative at the beginning is, um, is this a good time? <laughs> and people, you know, you know, you, you may be ready, you're up to here, you know what you want to say, but it doesn't work if it's not mutually convenient. So you could say, you know, I wanted to talk with you about something, um, but is this a good time? And then just make sure that you are creating a safe space um, and that there is enough time to do so. And then the first thing to do is to remember, if you are going to apologize, it's all about the person you hurt. Apology is not about me or my misunderstanding or my point of view or what I thought or I can't wait till you apologize. So uh, you forgive me so that we can move forward. Apology is a selfless, holy offering. So um, I just wanted to say that I can imagine how it feels still when I said to you in front of all those people that your hair looked funny that day. And, um, you know, the more I've thought about it, the more I imagine you didn't even know most of those people. It was your first time presenting to them. Um, how humiliating. And then you had to get it together to speak. And then you had to answer those questions. And I, I just think it had to have followed you for the rest of that day. And I am really sorry. And I, I, I just want to hear more about it, if you'd be willing to tell me more about how it was for you. So as we're inviting the other person to say more, if they're willing to do that, first of all, they're letting go of it a little bit, but you're not gonna let go of it if you don't think the person is going to hold it dearly. I'm not gonna tell you how vulnerable I felt if you're gonna like, okay, now you're doing something else or you're reading or you're on your phone. But if you show me genuine concern and regret and sorrow for having hurt this other person, then it's it becomes easy to say, you know, I have to be honest, it does still hurt, but I, I, I think, you know, you, you do understand somewhat of what I went through. So thank you for, um, for your apology. I don't feel like forgiving. That's fine. I may never feel like forgiving. That's not part of apology. Apology is owning it. Apology is imagining more and more ways it might have hurt you because that is what is missed when someone hurts us. They're not thinking about us. They're not empathizing. They're not feeling our pain. So if someone steps on your foot, it's usually okay to just say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. But if somebody breaks your foot, it's going to require more than that. And yeah. it, it's, it's, it's kind of simple if you look at it that way. I agree. Many, many things in in the education space really come down to taking some of these, you know, concepts of the mind and brain and spirit and, and superimposing them in a physical analogy. And then you're like, how would that go if this was a foot or an arm or whatever? And then I think it really sort of breaks it down a little bit for people. Yeah. Well, Shari, that was awesome. We've had, um, it's, it, we've really enjoyed chatting with you. Where can our audiences find you? And is oh, there something you. you'd like to oh, yes. send them to? Um, so you can go to the narrative method.org and you can sign up for our Thursday night conversations or Sunday morning writing. And you can also buy these awesome holiday gifts. These are our TNM DIY human cards. And they all have prompts based on the 12 core concepts. And you can use them yourself with groups or with one person or as one, you know, just writing prompts on, on your own. And they were designed because you don't need a license to use your humanity. 
Before there were therapists, there were friends. So be a friend, invite your colleagues, friends, family, and, and really connect. I love that. I'm totally going to get that. Please. <laughs> Very awesome. Thank you again for joining us. Great conversation. Thank you so much. If you like what you're hearing, don't forget to hit subscribe and please drop us a review. If you want to learn more about us or the ABC DEI podcast, visit abcdei.ca.